but I'm really excited to present John Sadaivi from Brown, who is going to tell us about how the genome rearranges itself during aging. Um, and um, looking forward to your talk. Okay, very thank much. you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Okay. Is there something that you expect me to do at this point? <laughs> there we go. All right. Is the cursor there? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Thanks. So you're probably all aware that about half of our genomes are repetitive. And uh, I'd like to dig into this a little bit more. Uh, obviously, there's centromeres, there's uh, telomeres, there's satellite sequences. But about 45% of the human genome is uh, derived at some point back in time from transposable elements. And uh, transposable elements come in multiple varieties. We are all familiar with the DNA transposons um, that uh, move around by a copy and paste mechanism. Now, these happen to be um, kind of extinct in the human genome. About 7% uh, uh, of our genome is derived from their sequences, but they're no longer active. Uh, so what we have is we have uh, retrotransposons, and they come in two flavors. Uh, the LTR retrotransposons, which are essentially the same as retroviruses, so you're all familiar with them. And then the, uh, appropriately and not very imaginatively named uh, non-LTR retrotransposons, which are much more primitive and are uh, also known as the line elements. And so this is a line element. Uh, obviously, it doesn't have any LTRs, uh, only encodes uh, two proteins. Uh, one of them, ORF1, is an RNA chaperone. And then ORF2 uh, encodes the enzymatic machinery that is necessary for retrotransposition, which is uh, obviously the reverse transcriptase and also the endonuclease. And this is a very primitive element. Um, just as one example, the closest relatives uh, sequence-wise of the line one reverse transcriptase are actually uh, group two introns in archibac bacteria. So, so these are really um, very ancient and very prevalent uh, retrotransposons. They're found in all organisms, including plants. In humans, they comprise about 17% of the genome. And the reason why uh, there's a lot of interest in them is that at least in the human genome, they are the only transposable elements that are capable of autonomous retrotransposition. So there, this is all that we have left. In the mouse, for example, there's other elements, uh, namely uh, quite a few LTR type uh, retroviral elements. Now, the genome defenses are highly effective. You might think that, you know, 17% of uh, your genome being, you know, jumping around is not such a good idea, and it definitely is not a good idea. So these things are dead. They're D-E-D, -E dead, okay? And out of that vast number of mere 100 to 150, I'm not going to use that pointer, it's... it's a little too touchy for me. Only a very small number are actually competent for uh, retrotransposition. And the, this really illustrates the, uh, this is a typical host pathogen relationship like you would have with, you know, COVID. And we've been having this relationship for millions and millions of years. And you can see that in the evolution of the line one element. So for example, uh, the only line one elements that are active, these are divided into families. So this is L1HS, uh, Homo sapiens, and then you have the subfamilies. And it's only really only these two that are still competent for retrotransposition. The most uh, recent uh, elements uh, these are the chimpanzee elements, and so you can see that chimpanzees have uh, different elements than we do. And uh, these, these guys are all dead, okay? They're full length, 
But the reason why they're dead is because they have accumulated point mutations just by the virtue of sitting in the genome for millions of years. And these point mutations render the proteins uh, it non non-functional. So it's, it's, it's really very uh, straightforward. Now, the transcriptional activation uh, of these elements has now uh, been well documented, and Tom Randall talked about the opening of chromatin that happens with aging. This is also now very well understood. And the, the really the important point here is that everything I've talked about before was in the germline because that's where the element has to retrotranspose in order to be propagated to the next generation. What we're going to talk about now is transposition in the somatic cells. And as far as the element is concerned, this is completely a dead end because if it transposes in any of your somatic cells, it's literally going to die with you, okay? However, uh, this, the, one of the consequences of this loss of heterochromatin is that the repeatome uh, becomes transcriptionally upregulated. And this is not limited to the active elements. This is a very broad transcriptional upregulation that includes, for example, satellite sequences. Centromeric satellites are transcribed and their transcription goes up uh, profoundly in senescent cells and also in, in uh, general aging. And part of this wave is the upregulation of the few remaining uh, retrotranspositionally competent elements. And so, um, what, what do we really care about? So, you know, we've already talked about the upstream changes. It's not just chromatin relaxation. There are other uh, antiviral factors that are compromised with aging. Now, the consequences are really interesting because these can range anywhere from misregulated uh, gene expression that doesn't require retrotransposition. Uh, you can have transposition. It'll, you know, jump into a gene and activate a gene. Uh, transposition is sloppy, so these elements cause a lot of DNA damage and uh, structural re rearrangements in, in the genome. And also, very interestingly, in somatic cells, they're recognized, uh, to put it very bluntly, as invading viruses. And that triggers the interferon system, and then that raises the very interesting question, how are they actually being sensed? And uh, I'm going to tell you a story about DNA sensing. So we think that, at least in part, line one elements are recognized through the CGAS thing pathway. And what uh, CGAS recognizes is the cDNA that is produced by the line one element. But uh, by no means do I think that is the, the, the whole story. So uh, just to show you some data, uh, this is the human genome. This is an experiment we did uh, a while ago in senescent fibroblasts. And you can see that many, many different elements in the genome are transcriptionally upregulated, including many older, prior, so the red dots are older elements that are full length. Uh, we know that they are transcribed from their own pr promoters, but they do not encode active enzymes, and the blue ones are the most recent subfamilies of L1HS. <coughs> so really the poster child for uh, line one uh, research in the last decade or so has been cancer, and it's now very clear that uh, L1s are activated in cancer, uh, are activated early in cancer, and in fact you get uh, frank retrotransposition. Uh, I should now parenthetically mention that, you know, one of the things that we have been working on uh, recently is the activation of line one elements in normal cells. And in normal cells, this has a very strong anti-proliferative effect. First of all, because normal cells will activate the interferon and that will shut down uh, cell 
division. And also because if they transpose and create DNA damage, this is going to trigger cell cycle checkpoints. So the cancer has to defeat this. So in order for the retrotransposon to become active, a cancer cell has to evolve. And one of the most frequent events is the mutation of P53. Because if you take out P53, cells become much more tolerant of uh, retrotransposition because they're now missing the important checkpoints. And this is just taken from a paper by Kathy Burns, which very elegantly shows that an antibody to ORF1 will stain at a very high level multiple cancers. Now, we have been particularly interested in uh, the interferon story, and this is the pathway that over the years we have developed. Uh, for now, it's cellular senescence uh, based, so we think that when a cell enters into cellular senescence, the chromatin opens, line one is transcribed, and then it's the uh, cDNA synthesis, which we have evidence happens actually in the cytoplasm, and that enables CGAS to recognize it, that initially triggers the interferon system. This also means that we can intervene at this step with reverse transcriptase inhibitors that have been developed against uh, HIV, because these drugs, to a certain extent, will also inhibit line one elements. And, and we've, we've, we've taken advantage of that. And of course, what happens then is that interferon is induced, and then interferon reinforces and maintains what we call late senescence and persistent SASP. So, so this is a story that we have uh, developed. Now, CGAS thing is uh, really hot right now, and I'm sorry that Andrea wasn't here to give her talk. And of course, you know, as things uh, always turn out, uh, they're much more complicated than you initially think. And now all of a sudden, the cytoplasm seems to be full of DNA that's coming from all over the place. Uh, mitochondria, I, I believe Joao Passos is going to tell you about that. And also from uh, the nucleus, Shelley Berger and Peter Adams have done a fair amount of work on that. And so somehow, this uh, double-stranded uh, DNA. We don't really know yet the uh, full uh, tally sheet and composition of the DNA species in the cytoplasm, but this is kind of the um, emerging picture at this, at this point. Now, while there is um, a lot of evidence for line one upregulation at the RNA level, the gold standard really is to detect it at the protein level because of the repetitive nature of the sequences, it's particularly with the Lumina sequencing, uh, it's, a, it's a real minefield. And there have been a lot of arguments in the field like who messed up what, okay, and I'm wrong and you're right or, you know, whatever. Uh, so in this particular view, you can see uh, mouse, hepat uh, mouse liver, and this is ORF1 protein staining, and to a large extent, it coincides with uh, senescence, area, areas of, of senescence. More recent work that's not published yet, we've turned to muscle, and we have actually found that uh, there are several cell types in uh, the muscle that uh, can upregulate line one, and interestingly, individual myonuclei in a single myofiber can upregulate line one. So you kind of now have this mosaic upregulation. Line one is not the only player in, in the field. Um, Guang Hui Liu has uh, recently published, I think, a really provocative paper showing that a presumably dead uh, LTR retrotransposons in, the human, in, in humans can become uh, transcriptionally upregulated in senescent cells and contribute to the senescent phenotypes. Now, let's turn a little bit to, to the drugs. So um, this is, again, a little bit of data from my lab. What we've been doing is uh, we've been treating mice with reverse transcriptase inhibitors. These are commercial uh, drugs. This is 3TC, also known 
as lamivudin, and uh, this happens to be adipose tissue, and you can see that these are naturally old uh, wild-type mice, and they show infiltration of macrophages. Uh, this is a function of old age. This is well known, and if you treat uh, the mouse for as little as two weeks uh, with 3TC in the drinking water, then you get um, you know, many fewer cells, and I'm not showing the data. We also have extensive data on uh, inflammatory markers, which are generally reduced across the board. So this uh, treatment does have <clears throat> a rather profound anti-inflammatory effect in naturally aged animals and uh, also in diseases. So for example, this is a couple of papers using two different models of tauopathy in the mouse. And in both cases, treatment with the same drug, 3TC, this has really taken off, uh, reduces markers of pathology. This is from the Spanish study and actually improves uh, cognition by, by several uh, cri criteria. This was published by the, the group from Colorado. Uh, and there's many other papers that uh, report the treatment of a variety of conditions with reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and for the large part, seems to have beneficial effects. And to close this, of course, uh, given all this, this has now been taken into clinical trials. None of these have yet been completed. Uh, the first one out of the block was Bess Frost at uh, uh, UT San Antonio, and she did a small open label trial with uh, 3TC that uh, has been completed, but the data have not yet been reported. Uh, the second trial is actually at Brown that uh, I am associated with, and we're using a slightly different drug, m -tricytabine. We're about halfway through. This is a phase two placebo-controlled trial, and uh, we're also collaborating with Cedar sinai and Nick Muzi in, in LA as a second site. And finally, in terms of uh, disclosure, I'm a co-founder of a startup, uh, Transposon Therapeutics, and we have two clinical trials, uh, also in the neurodegenerative space, on progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP, and also on ALS, uh, particularly one genetic, uh, the c 2 72 form of ALS. And this is using an HIV drug that was uh, developed, but then abandoned commercially. The drug is called Sensavudine, and it's about 100-fold more potent against line one than the other commercially available drugs. Now, that was a pure accident. It was never really tested for line one, but it provided a pretty quick trip to the clinic. And some of these trials will, uh, will report later this year. So thank you very much, and I really enjoyed speaking here. Thank you so much, John. This is super fascinating. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And repurposing drugs uh, is very much uh, laudable. Um, obviously, you get this question often. HIV patients who are on lamifedin, today, older patients, do you happen to know what their effects might be on cognition or... So, so it's already... The, the drug is already used in patients in combination with yeah. other drugs. So it's, could we extract some... Yes, and this has been done now by several groups, and it's a little bit complicated because, as you said, these patients are not just taking the reverse transcriptase but other drugs. But there is epidemiological data that has been published that um, reverse transcriptase inhibitors are associated now. Let's see, what is it now? Uh, macular degeneration, type 2 diabetes, and I think there's another that's been published that I don't remember, okay? But there, there definitely is epidemiological evidence that these drugs seem to have an effect on those diseases, yes. John, uh, wonderful talk as always. Uh, I was intrigued by the reverse transcriptases uh, in the human system. I, 
my textbook knowledge is a bit old. I thought there was no other than uh, telomerase uh, in terms of reverse transcriptase activity in humans. Oh, no, no. They're all over the place. <laughs> oh, right. So, so which one is the, the one with... Uh, well, there's multiple copies. There are copies, for example, of the endogenous retrovirus Earth K. So this is, you know, again, evolutionary, a very interesting story. This virus seems to have become extinct in the human germline five million years ago, which is nothing, okay? Uh, now, these viruses can also enter the human germline, so it doesn't mean that we're free of endogenous retroviruses forever. There are copies of HERF-K in the genome that are full length and, um, you know, without any stop codons or anything like that. And there's several, actually, quite a few copies, around 100 copies of line one that, you know, if you clone them out and express them, they're perfectly active enzymes. So the key is when and how do they get expressed? And that's very difficult to figure out. All right, thank you so much, John. That was really amazing.